Ooh, the roof's off through there. Frick. Keep going, keep going. We're currently heading north on one of the most iconic tracks in Australia, the Udna Data track. However, we might not even make it. Jeez, I've done a good job of it. Ah, stop. It's not a place you want to get stuck. Unseasonal rainfall has caused a whole heap of track closures. Our plans have changed probably more than 10 times already, but we're taking a bit of a chance on this one. There's a risk-reward here. This is early season. Big, expansive camping areas, far more remote. <laughs> Look at the claws on that sucker. This is exactly why we do it. This is Off Grid. After an amazing few weeks exploring the south coast of South Australia, Off Grid is heading to the top end. Our journey begins right here in the historic railway town of Maree. It's the southern gateway to the vast deserts that make up Central Australia. We're on a bit of a mission to make it all the way to the Northern Territory without touching one bit of blacktop. And for that, we're taking on the mighty Oodnadatta track. Our plan is to follow this 600k route out to the remote Udnadatta Roadhouse before tackling a much lesser known line out to one of the most isolated pubs in Australia, the Mount Dare Hotel. Given the conditions at this time of year, it's an ambitious plan, but with a bit of luck, we've got one heck of an adventure in front of us. Udnadatta track, it's all green lights, all roads are open, let's get stuck into this. It's hard to believe that on a hot, perfect day like this, cyclones to the far north could have pushed rainfall all the way south to have impacted us out here. This weather event literally only happens once a decade. Who knows what's ahead of us or if it's even possible to make it through. Mate, I am frothing at the chance to do the Udna Data. This is one of those bucket list items that we could not go past. So. Couldn't agree more. This is off grid in its entirety, mate. This is what it's all about. And speaking of which, there's a big van going in the back there. We've been towing this van for a few days now and it is an absolute dream. And let me tell you, it's pretty luxurious living back there. I'm hoping at some point I'm gonna get an invite. I'm not I'm not suggesting anything, I just, you know, you've been keeping it pretty secret. <laughs> oh look, if you're lucky, we might invite you in and, uh, you know, cook up a little feed for you perhaps. Yep, Steph and Harley have really stepped it up this trip and are trying out a brand new offering from Maverick Campers. 100% Aussie made off-road caravan, built for off-grid living. The Udnadatta is steeped in Aussie history and right along the track can be found the remains of a once key piece of outback infrastructure. Yeah, there you go, up ahead here, you can just see what remains, not much, but what remains of the old Kalana railway siding. These sidings, or I guess a better word for it is like railway stations, I suppose, dot the Udnadatta track all the way along because of course the Udnadatta track follows the Garn Railway, or the old Garn Railway. And these sidings here, were like refuel stations for them. And that big platform you can see right there was actually, of course, a water tank, gravity-fed water tank that they would use to fill up the steam trains that were going up and down the old Garn Railway. The railway system slowly replaced a huge workforce of Afghani cameleers that once supplied most of Central Australia via camel train. And that's how the new railway line got its name, the Afghan or Garn Line. Sightings like this served the line and provided accommodation for rail workers known as fettlers from its construction in the late 1800s all the way up till 1980 when the last train service between Maree and Alice Springs passed through. Much of the country we're passing through these days is devoted to cattle farming and the locals have come up with some creative ways to keep the wild animals out. Oh, this is interesting. This right here, this is the dog fence. It's obviously there to stop feral dogs from getting into grazing land and predating on, you know, sheep and cattle. But have a listen to this when I go over the top. Have a listen to this. Ready? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> That siren is actually there to scare the dogs off. Now, really interesting, the dog fence actually goes, well, it goes right across Australia. They do the exact same thing over in Western Australia in the Nanga World Heritage Area where they're not trying to keep dogs out, but rather feral cats. So when you drive past the very same thing in WA, you hear very loud dogs barking. Does it work? Wouldn't have a clue, but I've never seen a cat in there, so we'll go with yes. 
The Tracks North might all be open right now, but at this time of year, nothing is guaranteed. And reports are coming through of some flooding north of Udnadatta that might be heading our way. First sign of trouble is at the entrance to Lake Eyre. Lying some 15 metres below sea level, the lake is the lowest point in Australia. And as a precaution, the road out there has been closed. We can see the lake in the distance, but unfortunately, this is as close as we can get. Now, Lake Eyre is rarely filled with water, and unfortunately for the local yacht club, it only reaches full flood capacity a few times a century. Believe it or not, though, it's still possible to get a swim out here. And for that, you need to head to Coward Springs. Coward Springs, I don't know what they call Coward Springs, but I'll tell you what, this year ain't no coward. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. This one's getting straight on in. At 29 degrees, the springs are what you consider to be a hot spring. But when the weather is pushing 40 degrees, it actually feels pretty nippy. Ooh, that's fresh! It's very into it, but uh, that's why they call it Coward Springs. Because if you haven't got the kahunis to get in here, get on out! Lucky we're all friends here! <laughs> he tried to kill me. He got it on camera. <laughs> Nice little spot. Along Lovely. The Lovely little spot for us, though. Cold beers and camps. That way. <laughs> it's coming up to that time of day to find camp. However, I'm on a bit of a catch and cook mission in the driest place on earth. So tonight's camp needs to be something special. That a bit of a dream. Held onto it for a long time. And that is to catch a feed of yabbies in the middle of the desert. Now, I reckon everything goes according to plan. This little spot just down here might just be able to make my dreams become a reality. According to my research, this is going to be a cracking campsite as well, so let's just see how we go. If it all comes together, sunset, couple of brewskis, yabby nets in, and then an ambitious meal. I'll give you a hint. I better hop to it. This river camp feels like it's in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by arid desert, and this incredible camp pops up out of nowhere. Oh, look at that. Wait till you poke your nose up over the top of this. That is sensational. Oh, yes. This has got our name all over it. Cheering. Go oh, next to old ruin. In the distance over there, you can see the remains of the Alger Buckner Bridge, which we'll check out tomorrow, but for now, it's time to chase some tail. Just so happens that I've got three yabby traps. It's three of us. Steph. Ooh, thank you, sir. One time yabby pot. Thank you. Hals. Muchas gracias, That's a good senor. one, that one. The principle of these traps is pretty basic. You put some sort of food in the trap, the yabbies come in, and then, well, they can't find their way back out. Simple in theory, but choosing the right bait is where the disagreements start. A couple of weeks ago, on the old socials, you might remember I put a post up saying, what do you all out there in Australia land use as yabby bait? I reckon I got 500 answers, 500 of them were different. And I'm talking all sorts of weird things. Everyone from WA, in fact, if you are from WA and you go yabbying often, you all said, use a cockatoo, i.e. the bird, put a whole cockatoo in there. Weird. Heaps of people said, put a cat in there. I don't know what that's about. Uh, there was all sorts of other things like tins of cat food, that was very common, but the number one thing, the one thing above all else, and it kind of makes sense I suppose, when you're in the outback, bit of kangaroo. So, we're going to whack a bit of roux in there, see how we go. The other thing that I got asked, well told a lot, was mother-in-law. Really? Just cut a piece of your mother-in-law off. That's oh, rude. It is rude, isn't it? Let's not use that. No. Let's chuck roux in there instead. That had some heat behind it. <laughs> now look, when it comes to Marin in my neck of the woods, I can safely say I'm pretty expert. But honestly, everywhere else in Australia, I've struggled to catch freshwater crustaceans, and I'm hoping on this trip to turn my luck around. Still, based on hard learned experience, I've brought some other dinner ingredients for tonight as well. My little home away from home is soon set up for the night, but over at Stefan Harley's camp, setup has become just about as simple as parking up and opening their front door. 
Now, right behind us, obviously, we have a new van. This thing is bloody awesome. I am loving it. It's deluxe. Shall we uh, take him for a little look inside? Yeah. Stepping into the new van, and the first thing is just the space. This thing's awesome. We've got big kitchenette here. Storage for days. Storage for days. Big dining area. And my personal favourite is the big upright fridge in here. Look how much space is in here. So we've got a few more appliances in here now. Check out this awesome little stove top. Got a little grill under here. You'll see that being used soon. My favourite. We have our shower and our toilet separate and all this vanity space. Probably the best part about this is that it's 100% Australia made and fully off-road capable. So we are loving this thing and really keen to test this out over the next couple of weeks to see what's capable. Absolutely. Well, that's the prep work done on what is going to be a first. This is one of those meals that you don't bring out often, but when you do, you bring it out with gusto. So we're making stew. Super simple, except for one thing. Holy heck, when you look at it like that, it ain't very appetizing. Let me grab you a piece. That right there is a piece of none other than kangaroo tail. Where do we get this? You don't need to ask. But what we're gonna do is a long, slow kangaroo tail stew. Very outback kind of a meal. And I thought it was fitting for a trip up the Udna Data track. Now, first things first, I'm gonna dust these in flour. Then I'm just gonna brown them off in some olive oil, transfer them across to that plate, put a bit of cheeky garlic in there. When I say a bit of cheeky garlic, I put half a jar of garlic, which is a lot of garlic, because I quite like it. Now, my roux tail, what I'm gonna do with this is I'm just, oh, crikey. Didn't feel like a lot when I picked it up off the side of the road, but I'll tell you what, chuck that back in there. Let's just give that a little, how are you going with the onions? Kangaroo tail by its very nature is a sinewy meat. It does quite a bit of work, holds the kangaroo up. Like any sinewy, sort of tough, muscly working meat, it's gonna need a fair bit of time just to relax and release all its flavors and become really quite tender. When it does, it'll be some of the most tender meat you'll ever have, but it does take some time and it will need just a little bit more flavoring to go with it. This is not traditional in any way, shape or form, but I'm gonna add some tomato sauce because I can. And then just to give it the juices to cook in for the next hour, hour and a half, just a bit of stock. I'm not even gonna mention it, I'm not. Now, earlier on, you saw me over in the fridge putting a couple of little tiny cans in there. What were they all about? Well, what I put in the fridge was a cheeky white. What I've got right here is a cheeky red. This is <laughs> wine in a can. It's by Off Track Wines. The idea behind this is that if you want to have a little tipple, if you like a vino like I do, for example, taking bottles out in the middle of nowhere like this is ridiculous. It's so hard. That bottle has to come back in one piece. It doesn't reduce in volume. You can, you can break, you can have a glass hazard. With these bad boys right here, you get, look at this, you get 2.5 standard drinks per that little tiny can. When this is finished, you crush it, put it back in the box it came with. This is just a smart way to carry wine out in the bush. Now, I'm just gonna crack this one. This is a, like I said, this is a cheeky red. I'm just gonna put a pop of little, woo -hoo -hoo. Not too much, why not? Because if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. This is gonna go over on the fire now for about an hour, hour and a half, simmer away. Once we've done about an hour and a half, I'm gonna add the vegetables on top, back on the fire for another hour. If you're bald, this will put hairs on your head. Trust me. Well, I get into prepping the veg for the stew, the guys have gone to check on the pots and at last there's a small result, at least in Steph's net anyway. Oh my God, yummy! Yeah. Yeah. There we go, that's what we've come for. Yeah, That is next level. Normally, I'd serve this with the pastoral rice tonight. Rice, why? Because we've got a secret weapon. Holy heck, that's art. 
Now the bit I forgot to mention about kangaroo tail stew is that the meat is still attached to the tail. Mm. So thus, you're going to need to really put your boot on it in order to get it off there. But trust me when I say it is worthwhile. So grab yourself a big old nut. <laughs> it's not hard to get off the <laughs> ah, boat at all. So hot. <laughs> so hot. Delicious. It's good though, eh? Mm. Like it's so overlooked, but incredible. But honestly, that's like, that's practically like melting off the bone. Mm. You've set a high bar now. I really have. Mm. I really have. But look, we've had one big blue boy yabby. He was a good size. Mm. Yep. I reckon we leave those pots in overnight. If yep. we can just get, man, half a dozen. A couple. I'll be frothing. Yeah. Half a dozen, I'd be absolutely frothing. It'd be good, because uh, at the minute, you and I have caught zero. I oh, know. Last night, we left the pots out, and my fingers are crossed that I can finally get a run on the board. Oh, she's heavy. Come and get me, hold me waist. <sighs> Zero, they don't exist. Once again though, it's Steph that seems to be the yabby whisperer. Look at the power Can't stance on her. There we go. Hey, another bluey. They're good size. Yabbies do exist, but I don't know whether it's me or what it is. They don't exist in numbers. <laughs> well, speak for yourself, I got twice as many as you oh, did. Oh, you did, you did. Let him go, poor little bugger. Look yeah. at him. I promise you though, folks, the hunt is not over and we should still have another chance to get lucky. At least if we can make it to our planned destination. It's an absolutely stunning start to another day out here and that is at complete odds to the news we've just got from the old satellites telling us that to the north of us, absolute chaos. There was a big rain event that came through about a week ago, about seven days ago. Now, it doesn't need much rain out here for conditions to change dramatically, but that rain event that came through has suddenly sort of to leach down, and the roads to the north of us, pretty much all of them are closed. Doesn't leave us with too many options. One, of course, turn around, head back. I'm really not about that. The other is just keep mooching forward, following the road closure signs as they open up, making our way forward. We'll keep an eye on the news, and fingers crossed, the rain event up there allows us to get through. Those of you who are very observant will notice that we do not have a camera car in tow. Well, all good things must come to an end. The big rig, she's given up the ghost. And so that means I've got a grubby little cameraman in the big Y62. And have a look at the back. I used to take over the entire back. That was all mine. I've now been relegated a spot exactly that wide in the back. And the entire canopy is also full of camera gear. So folks, you'll never see his face, you'll never know his name. But right there is our cameraman, and I'm living with him. <laughs> I mentioned yesterday that our camp is near the ruins of the Alger Buckner Bridge, which until 2014 was the longest bridge in South Australia. It was built to take care of floodwaters when they came through the Neil River here, rushing through, so of course that the Garn Rail could continue during periods of big floods. Now, interesting story. Someone decided during one of the peak floods out here that they needed to get to the other side. Had to happen. So they put their FJ on that rail bridge and tried to drive across, but forgot to check the train timetables. Train came along, they couldn't get off the bridge, so the driver jumped in the water to safety. Train hit the car. That's why the car is on the side there today. As we cruise north, there's plenty more Garn history to explore, with sightings popping up at regular intervals along the route. Soon enough though, we're getting close to a major waypoint on our journey, the remote community of Udnadatta. Udnadatta is the driest town in the driest state on the driest continent in the world. There you go. Most importantly, when we get there, we are actually gonna find <laughs> out if the roads are open, if we can get past. Sure enough, we're starting to see the signs of water around the road. And in places like these, the line between a drivable road and being completely bogged 
is a lot closer than you might think. At last, the hottest and normally the driest town in all of Australia is on the horizon. And of course, the famous Pink Roadhouse. All right, big girl, take a drink. I oh, know you're not gonna like this. Just hold your nose and suck it up. Look at this, Steph's just fueling up down there and I bet you haven't seen this before. This right here, little TV screen we've got going on in the front of the car right here is a Pedder's Load Rider system. What it basically does is let you know what's going on both the front and the rear of the vehicle, then combines the two weights so that you can keep an eye on how much gear you've got in your vehicle so you don't go over your GVM. It's a really handy piece of kit, especially if you've got something like the D-Max here with the big canopy on the back, you know what it's like. It's so easy to put too much in the back of there that you don't really need and go over GVM, thus being illegal, but with this, as you can see, even as they put fuel in, you can see the rear start to bog down a little bit with a bit more fuel in there. And yeah, just keeps you legal. Make sure you know what your GVM's doing. If you want info on outback roads and station track closures, the local roadhouse is always a great source of info. And the news today, let's be honest, it was a bit mixed. I've got, uh, well, I've got bad news. Oh. I've got good news. Oh. And I've got excellent news. <laughs> I'm tantalized. The bad news is, Track North, that we need, yes. still closed. Yeah, of course. The good news, tomorrow morning with this wind and this uh, wind and the heat, yep. records it should be open. All right. Hey. So that's the good news. The excellent news, we're stuck in Udnadatta overnight. The <laughs> pub is open for the oh. first time in a number of years. Ooh. And tonight is a local pool comp. So oh. the great news is, is you've got me for a partner, my friend. Oh, look out Udnadatta. <laughs> We've soon found a spot to park up for the night at the back of the roadhouse, and with a night off in town, we're soon checking out the freshly reopened Transcontinental Hotel. Nothing in the world beats an Outback pub, and soon enough, a friendly competitions with the locals is heating up. Pool table? Not pool table. If you had to choose somewhere to be stuck, Udnadatta ain't a bad place to be. But for us, this adventure is about to heat up. We awake next morning to some good news. The road is drying out and we've gotten permission to push on north. Well, that was an eventful 24 hours in Udnadatta. We had the uh, keys to the city, so to speak, with all the country outback hospitality that goes along with it. And we won't get into too many details, but there's a very shady cameraman sitting next to me this morning. All right, enough on that. We have got uh, quite the adventure today, a little bit of time to try and make up as well. And if we can get to where I'm thinking, a cracking camp tonight, absolute cracking camp. Yeah, mate, I'm really keen to get back out of here and uh, start seeing the sights. Done deal, let's, uh, let's put a bit of pace on, make up a mile. Let's hope this road is holding up. While many travellers push back out to the main highway from Udnadatta, the route that we're on is a much less used backcountry run to Alice Springs, which hugs the edge of the Simpson Desert and will take us to one of the most remote pubs in the country, the Mount Dare Hotel. You're probably wondering why we've made such a big fuss about not driving on the roads out here. I mean, you guys go mud bogging all the time in your four-wheel drives. Well, it's not about that. The roads out here are a lifeline for the stations and the roadhouses and the people that live out here. What happens is they get just a small amount of rain and these roads turn to clay. Now, I know you can get through in your big 4 b with your big tyres, I know it. But what that does is cut the road up, it means they've got to get a greater out, super expensive, and it's just not sustainable out here. So when the roads are closed, you've got to listen to it. Not to mention that it's highly illegal. We got word that there were a couple of blokes in front of us that came through last week when they shouldn't have. You can see the damage that gets caused out here. Look at these ruts, they're huge. So that's exactly why we just held up in Udnadatta for 24 hours. It wasn't because we couldn't make it, of course we can make it. It's because the roads would get damaged. And that is so, so important out here. We've kept a close eye on things, and we're good to go this morning. As 
we push north, the conditions get more and more wet. And from what we've heard, it'll only get worse the closer we get to Mount Dare. Sloppy through there. Good tip if you drive it on roads like this where it's pretty good for 99% of it, but it just takes that 1% to catch you unawares in a boggy section. You think to yourself, well, I'll just power out of it and get through. But you've left stability or traction control on, and your vehicle prevents you from putting your foot down. It just happened to me then. It's a good idea to turn that off, even though you don't, well, you don't need it out here, but even though you don't anticipate getting stuck. You do want to be able to just put your foot down if need be and get out of a little tiny tricky situation. It might only be a car length you need to get through, but as you've all seen, if you drive a modern vehicle like I'm driving right now, it'll prevent you from doing that as soon as it detects any form of wheel spin. So, I'm going to turn my traction and stability control off just in case we need to use the big rig oh, to get out of trouble. My usual advice to people when four-wheel driving is to stick to the track wherever possible. But with these early season roads, we're taking a bit of a different approach whenever we can. Classic example, we've got water on the road here, but even the bypass is sloppy and pretty gross. But uh, way better than ripping up the road. Whoa, crikey. So when there is a little bypass like that, make sure you take it, because it just keeps these roads in pristine condition. Whereas the sides, just around those puddles, they can get a little bit chewed up, but it ain't making these roads where the trucks are going down all bumpy and gnarly. Oh, hey, there we go. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Whose idea was it to have the bloody window? Yeah, that's not my fault. That's on you. Sometimes, though, there's no choice but to stick to the road and just send it down the middle. Uh, we've got us a bit of a doozy here. I think the bottom will be nice and firm, but maybe just hang back. Yeah, it looks pretty rocky through here, mate, but the way you're zigging and zagging there, that might not be great. Oh, we got the swerves on. Oh, do you make some lugs? Yes, just floats through. Loves the mud. After a long day picking lines and negotiating ruts, we've made it to Lindsay Creek where I've heard I might just be able to get a crack at a Yabby Redemption. The creek is practically bursting its banks and gives us a clear indication of just how much rain has passed through here. Here we go, this little spot. I reckon if you're really quiet, you might just hear the Yabbies napping. <laughs> well, I think we get creative tonight because the kangaroo didn't work and going off the comments, any assortment of any delectable taste will uh, we'll bring them in. I think it's every man and woman for themselves today. We'll, uh, we'll try whatever we got in the fridges. I might even put a beer in there, see if they're thirsty. Have a go at this for a spot. Absolutely gorgeous, only one here. We haven't actually seen anyone, not a soul today, in all the distance that we've driven. Picture perfect campsite right next to this beautiful river right here. Now, the water levels are up a little bit, but in my humble opinion, that just means the Abbeys have got further to go in order to get to the food. So, I'm drawing them in. Stick with me on this one. I've got a very, very ambitious plan. Back in a minute. Out of the three of us, one of us has got to try and stick a little bit standard here. So, I have gone for the dirty, old, smelly ham that we had floating around in the fridge. But you're going a little <laughs> bit flash there, mate. What do you got? Well, I just figure I love salami, olives, you know, the Mediterranean tasty little morsels. So who doesn't love like the full cheese board spec? I've got a bit of camembert, a bit of dried apricot. I'm really treating these yabbies. Your bait quantity there seems to have uh, diminished a little bit in the last five minutes. Yeah, so... that's because, as I said, I love salami and olives, so I've got to save some for me too. Well, judging from my last experience with these bloody yabbies, plus all the answers you guys gave me, I've decided I'm going to go a concoction. This is leftover kangaroo tail stew. This is killing me to put this in here. Pork sausage. Potato, bit of veggie might as well. Apparently they're vegetarian. Tin of tuna, oily. If that doesn't catch me, a bloody yabby, they don't exist. Oh yeah, that had a good feeling. I've got my secret, marin stubby holder right here. Picture of a marin on there, so that's good luck. I'm gonna wet the whistle. Bit of beer on top, let's chuck her in. 
It's gone upside down. <laughs> Instant failure. <laughs> The best part of camping in Central Australia has got to be those desert evenings. And even after a 35 degree day, the nights get cold enough to call for a roaring campfire. Well, I gotta say, we have been a little bit challenged on this trip, we've had a couple of setbacks, but you know what? I love this because ordinarily coming through the desert, you don't get to see this kind of stuff right here. Normally that would only, like I say, be a small sliver of water. We've got it raging right up onto the banks here. It just adds to the adventure, and that's what off-grid is all about, for me anyway, is getting out here and seeing places you don't normally get to see, and doing it in luxury as well. Got my bed set up in there, everything's ready to rock and roll, I've got the hot water on. The great news is, I'm off cooking duties tonight, I'm gonna sit back by the fire. A couple of vinos. Life, folks, is bloody good. So tonight for dinner, we are cooking pizzas, which is gonna be exciting in the new oven. But first things first, I'm getting dessert sorted. And tonight I'm cooking a little apple quandong crumble because you know when in rome etc when you're in central australia coming through the flinders you've got to eat the local cuisine and best of all we're cooking it in the camp oven on the coals not many people have actually heard of a quandong before you'll find it around the flinders ranges central australia so this neck of the woods it's also referred to as a desert peach if you will and let me tell you it's absolutely delicious We've got the oven, we've got the grill in here. What better way to actually use it? Three dishes, three pizzas, a pulled pork dish, we've got a chicken, and then we've just got, you know, the lot, and that's everything deluxe. While Steph's currently on quality control over here, just tasting the product. Someone's gonna. We have one secret little ingredient here, and this one is Steph's Uncle Claude's homemade chili powder. Now, I am a fiend for chili for hot. This even makes Harley's eyes water. We might test the old man out, but this stuff is good gear. Now, when it comes to my fishing skills, I've been getting a bit of performance anxiety. So I'm checking the nets while Steph and Harley are in the kitchen. Salami and olives. Bit weird. Oh, there's a bit of weight in it. Stephanie J. Good Lord. It would appear she's found the Melbourne, the Melbourne Yabbies. Obviously enjoy a, uh, enjoy a more sophisticated diet. Chuck them in the bucket. Now that's technically free to Steph. This is Harley's pot. I think Harley's got some sort of processed ham in his. Oh, crikey Moses, there's something held onto it. Holy balls, Harley has slayed. And they're the blue boys, these are the ones we want. Look at the coloration on those bad boys. Absolutely gorgeous, and they're nice and clean. No mud, no silt on them. While the other two have cleaned up, in my net, I've caught a grand total of, well, zero. So I'm gonna do the sneaky and drop my net in Harley's spot. My only hope here is that I've got the guns big enough to bring that in. Grabs up. Holy Come in, mate. smoking balls. Do you oh. love it? I mean, in the middle of freaking Australia, and you've made one, four types of pizza. Well, oh, that's good, yeah. That's right. delicious. That's that as good as any pizza you'd have anywhere. Yeah. You nailed it. Dinner was absolutely on point, but there's more to come with Steph's apple crumble on the coals. All right, the Kondong apple crumble has been on there for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, and it is smelling delicious. All that's left is the ice cream. And of course, because it's a healthy crumble, we've gone with an oats topping, not your traditional shortbread crumble topping. It means we can load it up with ice cream and not feel guilty about it. Mm, this is freaking amazing. Pizzas, the best pizzas in the bush that I had before this, prior to this, were Sean's Stony Creek, Cape York. Oh. I'm going on record to say you've oh. utterly eclipsed. You've blown him out of the water. Wow. Those ones were Good incredible. Call. 
I may need uh, just a moment alone tomorrow because the chili <laughs> that you put on that one for me was superb. I've ne I'm not a big sweets person, but this is incredible. Just one more thing would make this day complete for me, and that's a Holy big old ball. net of yabbies. Holy fish. Ball. I've got none. <laughs> you got a can. <laughs> Oh, the magnitude of the failure just keeps <laughs> amazing me. Ow. Once again, we've left the nets in overnight. And sure enough, the guys have gotten a few more to add to the tally. Oh. Well, big dog. That's a good that's boy. A, that's a flaming marin. Look at the claws on that sucker. Hey. How many yabbies have you got? Oh, you got one too. Oh, he's got a good one. Please, if ever you, there was a person upstairs looking down upon me, make this the yabby day. Come on, you big dogs. Oh, Jesus, fighting. Oh, snagged. Typical. Me and yabbies. <laughs> Ah, uh, you're gonna have to get in there. Boots off, budgies on. Get in. Oh, there he is. <laughs> oh man, that's not gonna work. What is going on? <laughs> oh damn! <laughs> Give the yabbies what they want. <laughs> 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 what the people wanted. They say in life, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. If we get a beep button, cause <laughs> <laughs> Come traveling with Graham Cahill, they said. You'll learn off the wisdom, the wise man. That's Yabian, done and dusted. All right, folks, when, look, you take in the ones that we got last night, we have actually got quite the feed here, so we're gonna have these for lunch. Uh, but probably the quickest and easiest way to deal with these bad boys is we're just gonna chuck them straight in the fridge here, put them to sleep, and that way they'll still be right to go to the salvo. According to our maps, we're about 500 k's north of our start point at Maree, and the distance left to Mount Dare is just 100 k's or so. But make no mistake, Today's journey is going to be far from easy, with numerous rivers and low-lying areas to navigate. Well, despite waiting a few days, it's still a bit of water on the old roads here. We have actually heard from here on towards Mount Dare the roads are a bit how you're going. We noticed last night when we were camped here, the water level dropped by about that much just overnight, so I think we're going to be okay. But you just never know with these roads. Like I keep saying, they are open. Double check, triple check. Something tells me we might get just a little bit muddy. Once again, we're doing our best to avoid churning up the flooded sections of road where possible. But finding a clear route forward is getting harder as we go. Soon we're hitting creeks that look suspiciously soft and the bypasses around them look even more treacherous. This could be an easy drive or a car swallowing mess, but I guess there's only one way we're gonna find out. And yes, folks, these roads are 100% open. I have full faith in you, Captain. So we're gonna go through moderate sort of pace. Just gonna see what happens. Hopefully we just make it through here with a bit of luck. Oh, he's done it with ease. You may have to give it a little bit of sendage just because you're a bit smaller. Yeah, I'm thinking that. 
But uh, look, I'll see how it feels. Lighter vehicle I'm hoping might do a wonder. Maybe this is the time to chuck her on Ultimate 9, mate. Don't you worry, that was preloaded when I saw you go through. I love it. Righto, send her through. Coming. Get her, Hals. Get it, get it, get it. Yeah, nice Fall low and away you go. The problem we had is that when we walked across here to have a look, look where the water's coming up to now. Now give it a second and what happens is all this water washes back down, doesn't leave any prints on this side, so it looked to us as if no one had been through. The track doesn't let up for a second as we push onwards, but slowly and surely, we're making progress. Gee whiz, they must have had a significant amount of rain up here. It just seems to get wetter the further on we go. And I guess that's the risk and reward, isn't it, of coming out, you know, early season. We've seen virtually no other cars. For me, it's exactly why I like coming out at this time of year, because you've got the whole place to yourself, but you do have to contend with slightly challenging conditions. After a few muddy hours, it's time for a quick pit stop. And while I can't seem to catch a yabby, at least I can bloody well cook them. Oh, look at that. That is, well, that's hot as heck, but that's what I call an Outback Feast. Was that cool down for a minute or two? Shell these bad boys, and I reckon I'm just gonna have a bit of pepper and salt. And that's it, just enjoy the taste of the Udna Data track. Mm. Oh, man. Mm. That's delicious. Mm. That takes me back to my childhood. Yeah, that's On the farm. Know. Like anything, was a bit of effort involved, with my, especially <laughs> on my behalf, <laughs> jumping the old Albuquerque River. But when you get fresh yabbies, edge of the Simpson Desert, Udna Data track, Mount Dares is up there with a the cold brewski. Does it get much better? Absolutely it not. It actually does. You put a little bit of salt on there, just like that. Oh, that's a good dollop. Holy heck. That's good hot sauce. Yum. I reckon the back of my canopy might smell like a cooked yabby for a couple of weeks to come yet, but it's all worthwhile. Got a few questions uh, from the last series about the old Clearview drop down pantry here. Bloody love it. Super simple, super easy. Uh, it's a cooktop, of course, because I've got my induction cooker up on top here. But also, what you probably don't know about it is that down there in that box, I've got pots, pans, I've got a big wok, and you know, when you finish with it, you just fold the whole thing back up, up it goes and tucks away underneath the travel buddy there. So. For me, it's the all-in-one kind of kitchen solution that I wouldn't be able to recreate, I don't think, in any other way. And what I also love about it, when I get this out, it just brings all the surface area down to, well, let's just use the term, my height. By mid Arvo, we're in striking distance of Mount Dare. But with more and more water across the track, we're having to get creative to find a way through. But just when we thought we might be out of trouble, less than a kilometre from Mount Dare, we hit the biggest obstacle we've seen this trip. The main road looks like it could be undrivable. We can see people's attempts at bypassing the track in all directions, but nothing looks good. And suddenly, we're in a bit of trouble ourselves. That's us. Jeez, I've done a good job of it. The track felt a little, um a little chopped up, so I tried to come out wide and stick to the hard stuff, but turns out it wasn't as hard as what I thought it was, and um, now Harley's shoveling us out, and we're about to get winched. Well, we are so damn close. You could literally walk to Mount Dare, about 500 metres away. There's about 10 different tracks spearing off, 
We put the drone up and not one of those tracks looked like a track you'd want to drive. This one here looks like a big bypass, but it just heads out into swampy country. Makes no sense to me and it's not a place you want to get stuck because look at it, there's zero trees. 500 metres to the pub, if there's no beer, I'm going to be very, very <laughs> unhappy. Yep. Not sweaty one bit, not nervous, don't have three blokes here that just are fanging to get to the pub. <laughs> no pressure. All right, the boys are ready, Graham. Are you ready? Yeah, mate, foot on the brake, I'm good to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. The problem in situations like this is getting your vehicle to lift up out of the mud and not just dig further in. And unfortunately, the van is doing just that. We just need to get trailer tire to pop. There's so much mud pushing up under the van that it's acting like a brake on those tyres. And to make any progress, we need to get the wheels spinning. For that, I'm going to try and throw in some Max Tracks. See if it'll roll onto that. OK, take two. Sure enough, it's worked and given just enough leverage to lift the tyres up and over the bog. Oh, look at that. Yeah, we're up. Are we doing it? Keep going. Is yeah, it yeah. going? We're doing it. Yeah! Oh, that! Beautiful! That's it, mate! That Done! It? You're out! Yeah! You are out! Holy heck, we could plant some potatoes in there, come back next year. Oh my gosh! We did it, team! <laughs> well done! Thank gold for Max Trix. We've seen the hard way what can happen if we trust a bypass, and that leaves just one option. Like I've said before, sometimes the best way to do these things it's just to tackle them head on, so we're going to stick to the main road. And we've got a big long bog hole up here, but we just walked it, and the bottom feels like a road. So against all your instincts, I'm going to stick to the middle of the road and go through it. And actually feel the rocky base underneath. Keep my momentum up, not too fast. Just enough. I'm sort of just aiming in the middle. It looks bad ahead of me here, but I'm just going to stick on this middle line. Actually, pretty soft through there, but it's real soft through there. And then, hopefully, if I can pop up onto here, I'll your dad's brother. Oh, that's it. It's been a pretty wild first test for the guys and their new van, but it looks like they're making Keep it through going. as well. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, that's a go. Yeah, give it a bit of a wheel spin. Give it the wiggles. Give it the wiggles. Spot on, boys. Spot on. <laughs> yeah. 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 But at last, we've made it to one of the more remote pub stops you'll find anywhere in the country, the Mount Dare Hotel. And let me tell you, a cold bevy right now is going to taste pretty damn sweet. We made it. Froth on. Well, this is a bit of blooming luxury, and I'd like to give you a big cheers. Cheers, mate. Thank, thank, thank you. After a couple of days of getting through these tracks, it's always weird to sit, I feel like I shouldn't be here. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm all kind of dirty. At least need a shower. Yeah. Well, you look lovely though, I'm a bit, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Coming all filthy, you, the yeah. cars are covered. You've been working hard. Yeah. Our cars actually look less filthy than some of the others. Yes. Which is the interesting part because they've all come from the north. Yeah. Mm. That's exactly where we are going because they're only about halfway through this trip right now. We're actually aiming for Darwin. Yes. yes. That's the, that's the Final big. Final destination. And we're just short of the border. We're just short of the border. Just. Yes. And ain't no way we're heading out to the blacktop. No. So that'll give you a bit of an indication of what we've got coming up. Now, we've got about four different routes we can take from here. We're going to have a drink about it. Yep. Or two. See what happens. Yeah. And make a decision tomorrow on where we go from here. But, folks, as the cockatoos fly over and the sun sets right on the edge, the western edge of the Simpson Desert, I don't know, does it get any better? No. I think not. I don't think so either, folks. Just so that you get a little taste of what's in store, check this out. As for us, Cheers, Off Gridians. Cheers. Cheers. Catch us. Next time on Off Grid, join us as we check out the best of Central Australia.
steaming hot springs, desert camping, challenging outback roads, and some of the most stunning outback gorges you've probably never heard of. Plus, one slip of concentration that almost ends our trip. Oh. Coming soon on 4 Wheel Drive 24-7.